Welcome to the session. This is one byte at a time, deleting millions of rows from production systems. My name is Jared Boucher. I am a database engineer at Channel Advisor. Uh, before we get into the presentation, uh, do check, do go to pass.org and take a look at the other things that the Pass organization has to offer. There are local groups. There are SQL Saturday events. I go to and participate in both of those. There are Pass Marathon events that have live webinars. There are virtual groups and there are opportunities for people to get involved as volunteers if that is something that interests you. So please go to pass.org and see what else the organization has to offer. Also remember that uh, session evaluations are due Friday 5 p.m. That would be Friday, November 20th. So uh, there are prizes to go along with that. Please provide feedback to the presenters. It is helpful to all of us. Again, my name is Jared Pache. I've got my contact information here if you want to follow up with something after the session, and I will talk a little bit more about myself. Again, the session is one byte at a time, deleting millions of rows from production systems. Uh, this, is, this session's not only going to be about, about deleting data, but garbage collection processes were where I started with this process and in, in looking through some of the underlying mechanics. So I have been working with SQL Server since about 2002. I started um, teaching certification classes for SQL 7.0 at that point. Um, I later worked in CSS at Microsoft, so I did customer support in Microsoft for 10 years. Um, I mainly specialized in performance. I also did a lot of things in the storage engine area. Uh, since then, I have been working as a database administrator and developer for about five years. I'm currently working at Channel Advisor, which is involved in a lot of e-commerce transactions sort of behind the scenes. So between the work at Microsoft and the number of transactions and the amount of load I see in my current environment, I feel like I've had um, unique opportunities to learn about interesting performance issues. Uh, I'm a regular Saturday SQL Saturday speaker at more or less local events. I was going to do some more of those, but 2020 has been interesting for that. Um, and I've been uh, running a blog since last year where I've uh, talked about uh, interesting events and performance issues primarily that I've seen. So batching major operations. The, the point of this talk is to allow us to run really large operations that need to run against potentially multiple, uh, multiple millions of rows um, and allowing those to occur without interrupting services, without major blocking uh, or, or anything noticeable of that nature. Um, this came about mainly from work that I was doing on uh, old garbage collection processes that were not performing terribly well, but it, it applies to a number of other things that are regular scheduled processes you would probably want uh, to run in the background without much notice. Uh, garbage collection processes, data archival has a lot in common. Um, backfilling new rows in large tables. Um, you can, of course, add a default column to uh, add a default constraint to a column when you're adding it, but it's going to backfill all of that in one transaction and it's going to lock the table while you're doing that. Probably not advisable in a lot of cases. Um, this applies a lot to managing PII as well. So if you're doing GDPR or CCPA com compliance, you might need to anonymize, obfuscate, mask, or encrypt data. Well, to do that, you need to identify which rows meet your criteria and then update those rows. But again, you don't want to do, say, an entire table at a time, and you don't want there to be block uh, significant blocking or, or other things making the table unavailable. Uh, some of these lessons also apply to batching large queries or reports against an OLTP environment. So, and when I say large, think potentially millions of rows coming out into the final result set into whatever application. Well, we can split up those reads, those, those select statements into, into uh, batches as well and, uh, and make our operations a lot smoother because of that. And uh, the key part in batching all of these operations is we're going to be using the top clause in them and uh, understanding some specifics and some mechanics about how queries run when there is a top operator in the plan is going to be really key to us making sure that our performance is everything it can be. So for foundation we need to look at what an efficient top plan looks like and we need to go over how SQL Server executes queries in row mode. Um, and we're going to look at some common caveats. So here's an example execution plan. This is a query against the Wide World Importers database. All of my examples are from that database, and you can download that online. Um, I'll be going through most of my examples in the second half, and we'll, we'll break over into Management Studio, and I'll run a bunch of the examples. Um, all those examples should be provided with the uh, course files as well. 
Um, this case is a relatively straightforward query against the sales order lines table and we're doing a top 100. So you can see in the execution plan here that we are doing, we're returning 149 rows from our first operator, our first index seek. We're doing a key lookup and the key lookup returns only 100. So we're, we're reading some initial rows from the first index seek. They're going down to the key lookup. Some of those are getting filtered out additionally. Uh, we, we join those results together. Then we hit our top operator. So how does this actually work and how does row mode operate? Well, first, this is kind of what I would expect to see. We've got, we've got very few rows being read. We're not reading the entire table. We're not doing a scan. We don't have a huge amount of reads. And you can see from every operation that we're returning, you know, 100 rows or slightly more than that, which later get filtered down. But we're getting down to our 100 rows pretty fast. And once we've returned those 100 rows, we stop. The process stops at that point. We're not doing any additional unnecessary work. So looking at this, the data is flowing up from our leaf level nodes. So the data is flowing up from our index seek and our key lookup. But the, the thing that's really driving the query is the root node. So that select operator is the thing that really drives all the behavior underneath it. And as I've heard it described, basically the select operator tells the thing under it, the next operator down the line, uh, give me a row. And it goes off and does whatever it does. The select operator doesn't really care. When the select operator gets a row, it asks for another one. And it continues in this fashion until there's no more rows to provide to it, and at which point it's done. Um, and all the other operators are gonna operate in more or less this fashion. The nested loops is going to be asking the index seek for one row. Once it gets that row, it's gonna try to join it to information uh, to other rows in the key lookup operator. So it's gonna request uh, uh, rows from the key lookup operator. It'll join those once it has a row, uh, once it has that first row, it's going to pass it on to the top operator. And what is different about the top operator is that once it has received the 100 rows it asks for, it doesn't ask for any additional rows from the operators underneath it. So that stops the operation, that stops the query, um, and prevents us from doing any unnecessary work to retrieve additional results. So that's what a good execution plan looks like in a top plan. And that's how row mode functions. There's some common caveats that you're going to run into uh, blocking operators, especially sort operators. Now, um, and there are also some issues in how we write our queries and having conflicting criteria, uh, trying to make our query do two things at once. Um, you could also, I, I think of them also as uh, unaligned, uh, as alignment issues. So a blocking operator causes problems because let us say that this nested loops join. To go back to our example. So if the nested loops join, if that was a blocking operator, it would not operate in this row by row fashion. It wouldn't get a row from the underlying operators, process it, and then pass it on. It wants to see all applicable data from the operations underneath it. It's going to pull them all up, then it's going to operate on all of the data at once, and then start passing rows onto the top operator. So in, in, depending on the size of a table and the, and the query you're running, this could be reading millions and millions of rows and joining them together before only, before only returning you know, the first hundred of them to the top operator. That's really inefficient, and that's what we're going to try to avoid. And that's why we care about blocking operators. So I've explained to a bit what blocking operators were. This was actually a, a real... This was a real uh, interesting thing for me to learn. I've been working in SQL Server a long, long time and had never heard the term of blocking operators until we had uh, Grant Fritchie come to Channel Advisor and we were discussing performance uh, last year. And it was just, it was kind of stunning to me that I had never heard of the term. And it does make sense. Some of the blocking operators, you, it makes sense once you think about it, they're going to operate in this fashion. So my first blog post was titled Getting to the Bottom of Top and I talk largely about blocking operators. Um, I also have a link to a blog, a, not a blog post, but a link to a forum post where there was a discussion of what kind of operators are blocking operators. Now, the first one you're going to see is sort. Now, sort operators, it makes logical sense that it's going to block that flow. So let's say you have a, you have a sort, um, you know, after you've queried a couple of tables and joined the results together. If you're going to sort them based on a specific criteria, based on, you know, item ID or price or whatever, and you want to return the top 100. 
Well, you can't really, you can't sort the results until you have all of the results. The sort, sort operator can't operate in a row by row fashion um, unless, the, unless the data is already sorted in order, in which case you wouldn't need the sort operator. If you had been using an index that has data in order based on that criteria, you wouldn't need the sort operator at all. But if you're going to have to sort results, you have to have all the results first. Now, if your query is not written correctly or if you're using a bad index, you might end up sorting millions of, reading millions of rows so that you can sort millions of rows so that you can return the top 10. That's really not efficient. So that's uh, something we need to be very careful about. A hash match join is similarly a blocking operator, but only on the first of the two tables that it's joining. The reason is it takes that first join and the data from that first join and it has to build a hash table on it. It can't build the hash table until it has all of the results for it to build that table on. It's not going to build the, the table in a row by row fashion. It's going to read all the rows that apply for that first table, build the hash table on that, and then it's going to do its probing queries against the second table and that is operating in much more of a row by row fashion. But you've taken the hit already on the first table. Eager spools are another one. Um, it looks like uh, my understanding of table spools is we really have uh, two kinds of table spools. One is a lazy spool and that's not a blocking operator. It's, uh, it's doing its spooling but it's continuing to allow the normal flow of, of rows through that operator. An eager spool is going to again block, retrieve all the results in the underlying operations before it starts to pass those on. Um, my, you mainly see this with the Halloween problem. There may be other circumstances in which you'll see that, but eager spools are something to be aware of. Any kind of remote query, the remote part of it is going to happen uh, without, any, without any flow to the current system. Uh, scalar aggregates all also fall into this, but the main things that you're going to see to me is you're going to see sorts and hash matches and, prob and possibly eager spools the majority of the time. So coding strategies. Uh, there are a number of things I've seen in uh, the older procedures I worked on. I did a lot of work for about six months rewriting old garbage collection and archival processes and trying to make them uh, run more efficiently. And there were a number of things I learned from going through that. The first thing is to keep it simple. Um, I saw a number of cases where there was just extraneous logic, just layers and layers of complication that didn't need to be there. Um, one that really jumped out in my head was a was a process that was identifying rows from one central table that need to be garbage collected and then was having to delete from a couple dozen tables that related to it and that by itself was fine but it was done it was done inside three while loops <laughs> so the, the 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 original query returning a large uh, result set of records that need to be garbage collected was being then broken down and subdivided so that we're we're doing we're we're using one arbitrary value in the table that's from zero to nine and so we're we're basically doing a, we're doing a tenth of the things we've just returned we we only want to do the first tenth of them at at once and then we we only do uh, within the things that we've just subdivided let's only do it for one account at a time and then there was a third level on top of that so we have a a big O into the third operation as part of this garbage collection process. And we were doing that because I think the performance of it was originally bad, but the, the performance was bad because the first query we ran that was trying to retrieve data and store it in a temp table so that we can then delete from all the other tables. That initial query was poor. I mean, it, it wasn't performing bad. It was reading it was reading millions and millions of rows. There were blocking operators involved. There was an extra sort involved. And because of those things, the process was slow. So having, you know, three while loops and, and the extraneous logic on top of that didn't address the problem. What we needed to do was improve the initial query. Second, um, transact as necessary. So thinking of the previous example, if you are reading data from, if you're reading data into a temp table, and you're going to delete related rows from a number of other tables. Uh, let's say you get halfway through that and you've deleted records from a dozen tables and you have a deadlock or something else of a transient nature. Uh, if you have an error like that, do you really want to roll back a transaction and put the data you were deleting back into those dozen tables? Well, depending on your situation, that may make sense or may not. You may not want to be in this intermediate state 
where table 1 and table 13 are no longer in sync. So you may need to have a transaction around the entire operation, or you may not. You may need to have it on a certain subset of rows. But um, in some circumstances, if you don't need to ensure that all of them are happening at the exact same time, you're just you, you're preventing additional work that you'd have to do next time through uh, the exact same loop. One of the things to keep in mind too, and I don't really have a, a data point for uh, a, a bullet point for this, but in a lot of the procedures I have doing garbage collection or doing similar processes, um, I'm telling it to run in a loop, and I'm telling it go find a batch of these records and delete them, and if you're done and you've still got time left, then go do another batch. So delete a thousand rows. If if it didn't take you 30 seconds, go delete another thousand. Um, and one thing to think about with that is to always look for a way to stop when you can without doing additional work. So if you've if you're doing a batch size of a thousand and you run through one time and you identify 900 rows to delete, you don't need to do another loop. You don't need to you. At that point, you know you, you only found 900 rows that match your criteria. Once you delete those, you can be done. You don't need to continue looping and running the query again and again. There's nothing else to find. Um, another important thing is to consider the negative. So some operators, especially you, you might see an index scan operator in one of these queries, and it might perform just fine. Um, but you might find that it performs fine while you're actually finding rows that meet your criteria. You might do that quickly, and thus your index scan doesn't actually end up reading that many rows. But what if there's nothing that meets your criteria anymore? What happens when you've, when you've, you've already GC'd everything in this table, you've caught up, the next time you run that process and it's looking for records and it's not finding anything, it's not going to hit its batch size quickly and return. It might end up if it's an index scan operation at the base of this, uh, at the base of your execution plan, it might just scan the entire table. So when you're testing this, when you're developing a process, do be on the lookout for that. See what happens when you're not actually returning any data, when you're not finding anything that meets your criteria. If your indexes and your queries are aligned properly, it should look for the data efficiently, find that it, there's no data that matches, and then you can bail again. So testing your batch size. This came up in an instance when I was trying to write essentially a reporting process that was returning millions and millions of rows potentially and was doing that in a piecemeal fashion. And my expectation was we'd probably do a batch size of maybe 100 rows or maybe 1,000 rows, but I tested smaller sizes and I tested larger sizes. And I ended up with a batch size of 10,000 because it was actually more efficient and more performant getting 10,000 rows than it was at 100 or 1,000. So uh, always test these things because you, you might be surprised what the results are. And parameterize. So when I'm writing a process like this, I'm writing a stored procedure we're going to be running many, many times. We're going to be scheduling it as a job or something else similar. Um, I like to put in parameters to allow me to control how the thing operates, primarily for the batch size. I might find that under specific circumstances I need to vary the batch size. Or I might need to vary uh, how long I want this process to continue looping. Maybe I'll run this job every hour and let it run for 30 seconds. Or maybe I'll, uh, or maybe if we have an influx in data in a given circumstance, uh, or maybe if we have an influx of data in a certain place, and I and I know that we need to do additional cleanup in that area, uh, I could I could adjust that parameter and allow it to run for longer. Updates. So I keep talking about GCs, and GCs are uh, are were the majority of work I was doing for six months. But there's also a number of reasons why you might be doing something similar that you're wanting to do piecemeal updates in your tables. So the immediate one that comes to mind for me is PII. So if you're doing say anonymization or obfuscation of data in a table, then what you're probably trying to do is take specific character fields. And, and, and make whatever change to that. If you're, if you're doing something complicated to mask it or hash it, that would be an update to it. But let's say, simple example, let's say you're gonna take a, a record, uh, let's say you're gonna take a couple of fields and you're going to set them to empty string or null. There's a problem that can come up with that, um, is that your updates can get progressively slower. 
This is different than a delete operation. A delete operation will identify however many rows, identify the batch size of rows, and will delete them. The next time you run that same query, it's not going to have to read those same rows and, and like skip past them. You deleted them, they're gone. But the next time you run an update statement, if you've anonymized 100 rows, you've, you've, uh, you've set those fields to empty string. The next time you run your query, those same records are still going to be in the same index. You're going to read them, you're going to filter them out because they don't meet your criteria because they're not currently populated, whatever. But however you identify that, you're going to see, oh, these rows don't matter. Let me read past them and get the next hundred. Um, as you continue operating and you have more and more data that you have already processed, you're going to have more and more records that you have to read past. Um, I thought of this as, as, I, as I made this realization, I kind of thought of them as not being self-cleaning. Deletes are self-cleaning and updates are not self-cleaning. So you're going to have more, more data to read past every time. And the solution to this, to me, was quite obvious. Use filtered indexes. So let's say we have a filtered index on our table that we're doing anonymization on. So if we have a filtered index and our filter is character string is not null, then when your process comes through and nulls out that field, it's actually going to be removed from the filtered index. Now, for this, you'd really, you, you would need to make sure that your update process is actually using the filtered index. So maybe you want to put an index hint on that, or maybe you just, you know, double and triple check that the optimizer, when you're, when you're testing it, that the optimizer is choosing that index as opposed to something else. But if you have a filtered index that does this, it can make a huge difference on your update processes. Inequality queries. If, especially if, if we're doing garbage collection, if we're doing anonymization, a, a lot of our logic is going to be based around date. We're going to have some kind of a retention period in mind, and we want to remove everything that is outside of our retention period, so anything older than a certain date. If that's the case, we're going to be doing inequality statements in our queries. So this is something I wanted to mention because it could cause weird behavior and bad plans, and those bad plans could have index seeks or they could have hash matches. And if they have hash matches and they introduce a blocking operator, that can really, really affect our performance. The 30% estimate is something that the optimizer does when it is doing an inequality query. So it's searching a table based on some value is less than or equal to, is less than or greater than a specific value but it doesn't have good statistics or useful statistics to make a good estimate. So if you are comparing, uh, so if you're doing a, a, a GC and you're saying find 100 records that are older than this date, that are older than 90 days old, you're doing an inequality. If, the, if your date is stored in a local variable, SQL Server is not going to really have statistics on that variable, and the behavior you may see is that SQL can't make a good estimate, so it thinks it's going to read 30% of the table. 30% of the table is actually quite a lot. If, it's, if it thinks it's going to return that much of the table from its query, it may just decide to scan the table, or it may decide to do a different join between two tables. Specifically, like I said earlier, if it's doing a hash match, that's bad for us. If you have more complex criteria, if your criteria isn't just based on date, uh, something more complicated a SQL Server may be able to get, to find useful statistics for a different column, and that may actually help it come up with a with a with a reasonable estimate and a good execution plan. But if you're doing something that's based purely on the inequality, keep this in mind that this could be a real problem that could throw off your execution plans. Also, if you are indexing an inequality seek, put the inequality column last. So if you're basing your your process off of say a date time field, but also some additional status fields. You want to make sure this thing is actually, you know, completed and, and you don't need this data in from anymore and you want to make sure it's beyond a given date. Put the date last. It leads to more effect it put put it last in your indexes because it leads to a more effective use of the index. Um, if the inequality comes first, the date range you're looking at is going to contain inside of it all those status fields. SQL Server is going to have to read the entire date range, and it won't be able to essentially read fewer rows because of the status fields. 
If your status field is first, it can look only for the status that means I don't need this record anymore. And then within it, it can filter a, a date range, but it cannot, but it can't do it in reverse. So if it's doing the inequality seek first, the other columns become less valuable to you. It'll still filter them out, but you will read substantially more rows because of that. So that is another efficiency you can gain um, if you're doing inequalities. So we've completed the uh, we've completed the slides I wanted to go through. Uh, now I've got a number of examples I would like to show you in Management Studio. Um, the queries for all of the examples should be attached to the presentation and the and the files for the rest of the talk. All of these examples are based on the Wide World Importers database. Um, I've got a couple. Uh, they're they are grouped according to how they're numbered. So some of the examples go together. Um, there's a set of them about just the the top behavior and how blocking operators interrupt the flow of an execution plan. There's a simple garbage collection process. There's a more comprehensive garbage collection process. There is an example of how updating works with and without filtered indexes. And there's uh, some examples using inequality estimates. So we will go through each of these in Management Studio. So I have a number of scripts here. Um, a couple of them are numbered 0 and 0, 1, and those just and these are just to restore the database to its initial state, which I've already done. And this is to uh, create an index that supports a foreign key relationship that would show up as a problem if we didn't have that index. And now we've got that completed. So that's just a little bit of setup for us to get started. So let's look at the top operator and how it behaves uh, initially. So here's a simple uh, query against the Worldwide Importers database against the order lines table. Um, it's got a WHERE clause and we're going to see how this behaves when we run this top 100 query. So runs reasonably fast. We can see here uh, my execution plan we're doing an index seek. We are reading we're reading 100 rows, we're returning 100 rows and we're actually we're actually reading 943 rows. We're filtering some things out in the seek predicate and some more in the predicate. That's why we're reading more than 100 rows all told. But we're returning 100 rows from this operator, at which point, once the top operator has received those 100 rows, it shuts the operation down and we don't do any further work. This is what we expect to see if things are going relatively well. Um, we could do better if we had an index that supported this better, but since we've got two inequality queries, we weren't going to, um, we're not going to be able to seek on both of those criteria. Next example, this is, we have a WHERE clause here and we have criteria against the sales order line table, but we also have an order BY clause. So let's run this query and see what we get here. So again, we've got a relatively good execution plan. Now, we're doing an index seek and we're returning 149 rows. We're later in our key lookup filtering some of these out and ending up with 100 rows that goes through the nested loops operator and into the top, and we're not doing any additional work. This is the, this is a, we, there was a screenshot of this example that I used earlier in the presentation as an initial, uh, as initial example of what the flow of a top, of a, of a top query looks like. So this is again, what we would more or less expect. You might have, one of the things you might have noticed here is that we have the order ID in our WHERE clause, but we also have it in our order by. In other cases, this might cause a problem if we have a, a WHERE clause and we have an order by, but because they're keyed on the same column, in this case, it's fine. We were already returning the results or already using an index that is based on order ID anyway. So going on to the next example. In this example, we're actually doing a join between orders and order lines. We have uh, the same criteria I think we had in the previous query. And let's look at the execution plan for this. Now, again, we're doing, well, we're getting very different behavior in this case. So what is happening? Let's look in here. We've got a clustered index seek against the orders table, but we're reading 5,000 rows. This is a lot more than we needed. We also have a hash match operator instead of a join, instead of a normal uh, nested loops join. The hash match is a blocking operator, and specifically, it's a blocking operator on the on the first table seek and not the second. The hash match blocks waiting for the input from this initial table seek that, so that it can construct its hash table. It's constructed the hash table, then it can operate uh, more normally with the other operator. There's a couple of things we can do to improve this. 
uh, but primarily we probably we may need a better index uh, to support this query. We may find that having that the that the criteria we're providing on the sales order lines table is uh, doesn't make logical sense for what we're doing in this case. But we really want to get rid of that hash match operator. The reason we're returning 900 rows though and not 100 from the scan operator is because the hash match is actually operating in batch mode. This table does have uh, some column store indexes on it so the optimizer has that option and in this case it's decided to go read a batch of 900 rows and it requested all of that from our scan at the same time. Uh, the fact that we're doing a scan is still an issue. It might be that we need to make a better uh, index on this table or we need to make some other adjustment. But this is an example of, a of an execution plan for a top query that is not performing like I would intend. Um, I have a comment here in our hash because the behavior has been uh, inconsistent at times and sometimes I would see a hash match and sometimes not. Um, I also have an order by clause here and here's an example of another problem you might run into. So let's comment that, let's uncomment that and see what happens when we run the query. And what we've got now is our behavior is even worse. We're still looking up the 5,000 rows from the first table. We're still doing a hash match. But now our clustered index scan against the order lines table is reading uh, significantly more rows. We're reading 11,000 rows and returning that up. And our top operator is also having to sort the results. So we're returning all 11,000 rows up to that top operator so that it can sort the results before it actually gives us the top 100 out of it. So this is what I would say is we've kind of got conflicted criteria here. Um, we're, we're wanting to look at look at an index based on, okay, probably order ID, but we're telling at the same time to order the results based on last edited win. These two things are in conflict. We could either use an index that um, contains the data in the, in the uh, order we want our results to be returned in. Uh, if we didn't have the where clause, but we just said return top 100 order by last edited win, we would use an index based on that and we return the first hundred rows and that would be that would be it and it would operate very quickly. Um, otherwise, if we're just telling it to behave based on the order ID and we have an index that's supporting our where clause well, well but we don't have the order by clause set on a, a different column, we would expect better behavior there. But um, one of the things I've seen uh, multiple examples of is a query like this where we have a where clause and an order by clause that are trying to get the optimizer to do two different things at one time. It can't look at an index based on order ID and last edited when at the same time. It doesn't work. And either way, you're going to tend to uh, either be scanning the index or doing a, a great amount more reads than you would expect you would need to for a top 100 query. So in our last example, Let's look at a query just based on order lines that has the where clause and the order by. So if I look at the execution plan for this, you can see here we're, we're, we're scanning the clustered index because we don't have another way to uh, more efficiently fulfill the query as it's written. Because, we're have a, because we have filters on the order ID and the quantity, but we're insisting that things be sorted by last edited when, uh, we're in short, we're reading everything in the table so that we can do all the things that are required here and we still have a top operator that is also, uh, and our top operator is also doing a sort at the same time. Um, I have an index down here that is creating an index based on last edited win. So let's add that and see if our behavior changes significantly. And well, our behavior has changed, but you can't say that it's really improved. Now we're trying to do uh, a multitude of things here. We're using an index seek we're using a column store index that's present on the table, and then we're doing an index scan on top of it and doing a hash match. So the, the, the lesson here really is to, is to uh, really figure out between your order by and your where clause what it is you're going for here. If the criteria is that we need to um, return specific things that our, that our later operations are going to use, then we don't really need the order by. Um, in this case, we're just making life a lot more complicated by trying to insist uh, uh, on the order by. Um, if this is something that's being used by, say, a garbage collection process and, and the, the criteria doesn't really work for that, but if, if we're trying to return records that we're then going to delete, does it really matter what order you delete them in? And the answer is probably not. So let's move on to our next few examples. So here I have a, we're going to do a simple garbage collection process on the 
vehicle temperatures table that's in this database. We're going to try to get a batch of 100 rows. We're going to throw them into a temp table, just the vehicle temperature IDs. Uh, we're going to look for only rows that are older than 50 months. So we're going to say that's what our data retention period is. And then we are going to uh, delete those records back out of the base table. So uh, if you're in an example where you, if the table that you're working off of, if the vehicle temperatures table, say, had related tables, having the data in the temp table would allow us to clean up things in related tables based on the vehicle temperature ID. So we could uh, find our 100 rows, put them into the temp table, delete from all the related tables before we delete from vehicle temperature. Uh, we're going to do one batch of this, and I'm actually going to roll back the transaction afterwards so I've still got the same number of rows in the table. So let's run this first and see what our plan looks like. So here, we're doing a table scan of vehicle temperature. Uh, and you can see here we're returning 179 rows, which looks like we filtered down later. Uh, this execution plan isn't terrible, but like I said earlier, we need to be suspicious of the fact that we've got a table scan here. So let me zoom in for just a second. Uh, we are reading 179 rows. Um, so it's not that we read an awful lot of rows here or that it took a terrible amount of time. But the fact that we are doing a table scan here says that we're not using a reasonable index for this operation. My concern is, in this case, um, we found uh, we found 100 rows that we needed to actually get rid of because they're old enough in the first 179 that we actually read. But once we get down to the point that we've uh, GC'd this table and we've kind of caught up and we removed all the old records from this table, what we're going to find is we're still going to be doing a table scan. And that might mean if there's, if there's no records to delete, we're not going to find 100 rows that meet our criteria quickly. What we're going to end up doing is we're going to try to read through all the records in the table. And that may be very time consuming for us. But we're going to read all the rows in that table looking for 100 that match our criteria when none may exist. So the fact that we're doing a table scan here, even though it's happening relatively quickly, is a bad sign. Um, so I've actually got an index up here. I'm going to add this to our table, and we're going to run this again and see how that same query operates. So if we look at the execution plan a second time, I can see now we're doing an index seek. We are reading exactly 100 rows, returning them. Um, that's going into the top operator, and uh, we're inserting that into our temp table. So. We have an index scan against the temp table, but I'm not too concerned about the fact that we're scanning the temp table. I know how many rows are going to be in there. Uh, we're, we have a nested loops join to the vehicle temperatures table. We're only reading 100 rows. We're passing that through and we delete our 100 rows. So this is a, a pretty clean example. I'm a lot less concerned with how this will perform long term with that index in place. But of course, um, I talked about having the temp table and using it as a way to delete things from related tables. Well, but in this case, we don't really have any related tables. So uh, creating the temp table is actually extra work for us and populating it is extra work for us. We don't need to do that for this case. A simpler example would be this. All we need to do is to put our top, uh, our top batch size in our delete statement itself. And this is sufficient for what we are doing. So let's look at the execution plan for that. So. We've run it, and this is interesting, but we've got we've got a table scan again. So this is an interesting uh, circumstance because we we have an index that's supporting it. We created it in the other window. It's actually still commented in this script as well. But the index is based on the index is based on recorded win, and our where clause is based on recorded win. And we're not sorting anything, so we're just telling it find things that are older than this date. And since the index is going to be in order by the date, we should be finding this in the first 100 rows. And I'm not sure why we're looking at a table scan here instead of just using the index. And again, this makes me concerned about the behavior we're going to get uh, if we run out of things to GC. We're going to be continuing to table scan, and this could take a great amount of time. And in circumstances like this, I think some people are a lot more hesitant to use a to use, say, index hints or join hints. I am not particularly fussed about using them. I find that sometimes I, I know what the behavior should be in this case, and I'm not, I'm not fussed about 
adding an index hint when it seems like the optimizer is making a, a less than optimal decision. So let me put in an index hint for the index we, that we just created and let's see what our behavior is now. Well now this is this is what I would expect it to be. We have an index seek, we return 100 rows, we only read 100 rows. Since it's in order by date, of course the first things are going to be the oldest records and those should be the ones we're wanting to get rid of. Uh, once we've actually gotten to the point that we've caught up, we should be in a situation when there's no rows to GC. The, the first thing we read out of this index, we should be able to tell that that record is newer than our, than our retention period. And so we'll stop the operation at that point. We'll have read one row basically in the index and we won't return anything to the top operator and the operation will stop. But in this case, now that we've got the index hint, we're, we're returning 100 rows, we're passing that along to the top operator and we're done very quickly. So let's do one more example based off this. So one of the things I will frequently do is if I, if I have a garbage collection or an archival process, if the process is performing well, um, I, I, I still use the batch size, whatever seems appropriate, to have it do a, a reasonable bite-sized chunk of data and get it moving. But if that's, if that's performing quickly and it's taking milliseconds, then why not go ahead and run through and get a couple of other batches and do a series of small operations um, and potentially small transactions if we're deciding that that needs to take place in a transaction. So here's an example of what it looks like when we're doing a, a loop. So same table, same where clause, um, here I'm deciding that my, I'm setting that my batch size is 100. I'm setting the duration to be five, five seconds in this case, and I'm declaring an end time parameter. So I'm calculating my end time to be uh, to do a date add based on the get UTC date. So I'm adding five seconds to get UTC date, and I'm storing that in end time. Um, each iteration of the loop, I'm going to run get UTC date, and as long as the current time is before the end time I calculated we're going to try to do another batch of this delete statement. So in this case, I'm going to still delete uh, 100 rows from a uh, vehicle temperature based on the same criteria. And as long as we don't get, as long as we operate on more than zero rows, we'll go back, we'll continue to go back through the loop. But if we do the delete and we get zero rows, then we'll just break and we'll stop at that point because there's nothing else to be done. So let's try this and see what we get. Okay, it's coming through. And so when we look at this, we can actually see we did 54 batches, um, but we can see the table scan operator is back. So we're still doing the table scan uh, for whatever reason, we're not picking up that index that was created for the purpose. So I have added the index hint back into our query. Let's run this again and see how this operates uh, and if it's substantially faster or slower with the index hint in place. So we had done 54 batches before this time we actually did 61. Okay, um, I actually wouldn't have been fussed if it was slightly slower. What I'm really protecting myself against by having the index hint, I know that we're doing a seek, is I'm protecting, a, protecting us against the circumstance where we end up scanning the table and there's no records that meet our criteria, so there's nothing for the GC to really do. We've got our operation using the top, using the index like we want, and we're able to do very small bite-sized operations also, if uh, I've, I had one transaction around this whole operation so that I could roll it back and kind of uh, keep the table in its original state. But if you were doing this, you would probably, if you needed a transaction, you'd probably do one transaction inside the loop. So each time you operate through, um, through the work of your while loop, you'll have one transaction. And in this case, we would have a series of very small transactions indeed. Uh, for, this for this operation, since we're only doing one actual DML operation, you really don't need to have a transaction at all, and SQL Server will just commit the delete statement as soon as it's complete, and that would be fine in this case. So for our next example, I wanted to do something that was a, li a little more, uh, a little more comprehensive. So this is a procedure that will do garbage collection against the orders table, and I'm doing a batch size of 100 seconds, and I've got the duration defaulting to 30 seconds. We won't run it for quite that long, and I have a I have a variable here just to detect whether we are inside a transaction already once we're inside this stored procedure, and if so, we won't create another uh, another transaction. Whatever's calling this procedure has already handled that if there's a transaction existing at that level. We're still going to calculate an end time. I've got two temp tables here, one for tracking order IDs that I want to garbage collect, 
and a second one tracking invoice IDs. You'll see why in just a moment. So we start our, we, we calculate our end time and we start our while loop. We truncate both of our tables. Um, if there's an existing transaction, then we are, then we are going to set the flag that there is, that we're already in a transaction and we're not going to start a new one. Okay, so the first thing we're going to identify is rows in the orders table that are more than 50 months old. That's what we're going to be garbage collecting. We're only going to do 100 rows. Now, since we have related tables here, we are going to be using temp tables. We're going to identify the rows we want to garbage collect from the sales order table. We're going to put those IDs in our first temp table. Uh, the next operation is we're actually deleting from the sales order lines table, which is based off order ID as well. And we're joining our temp table to sales order lines. Um, notice there's not a top clause here. Uh, it might well be that 100 orders will translate to more than 100 order lines. I would expect so. Well, we don't want to delete just 100 of, the, of those rows. We want to delete all of them that relate to those order IDs so that we can then delete the order IDs later without having a foreign key violation or something similar. Now, the next thing I would want to do is I would want to go look at the invoices table and, and delete rows from it. But the invoices table also has other tables that relate to it. So we're going to identify the invoice IDs and put them in a second temp table. Again, I've actually got it commented out here. Uh, there's a top clause here. We, we don't want that top clause. Again, um, I don't know for certain what the cardinality between my orders and my invoices is. It's probably one to one, but logically speaking, we want to get rid of all invoices that are related to any of the order IDs we've already identified. We have a hundred uh, order IDs, but we're, gonna, we're, we're not gonna limit ourselves on the number of invoices that we're going to garbage collect here. So I'm gonna find all related invoices all invoices that are related to the data in the orders GC temp table, and we're gonna put that in the invoices GC table. From there, we have three tables that are related to invoice IDs, and we're going to delete from all three of those. Again, we don't need top clauses. Once those are done, now we can delete records from the invoices table, and once invoices has been GC'd, now we can delete records from the sales order table. And at this point, the procedure will commit the transaction if we weren't already inside one transaction. And this is the point where you could really ask yourself, so if we get part of the way through this operation and say we've, we've uh, deleted from the order lines table and these invoice related tables, and let's say at this point we have a deadlock when we try to delete from the invoices table. Since we're in a transaction, we hit an error, we're gonna roll back all the things that we've already deleted. Uh, is that appropriate? Do you need to make sure that all these tables are kind of in lockstep with each other? Uh, you might well decide that the answer is yes, but there might be circumstances where you can say, well, we've already deleted those the, the, the data from the first four tables. That's fine, we don't need to roll that back. That's a, that'll be a, a decision you can make on a case-by-case -case basis and maybe make it a little bit more efficient, but it might not be a, a huge decision unless, uh, unless deadlocks are particularly uh, prevalent in your environment. So after creating the transaction, or after creating the procedure, we're gonna begin a transaction, we're gonna run it for five seconds and see what our behavior is and see what our execution plans look like. And this is only set to run for five seconds. It might go through and do multiple loops, not really sure. So let's see what we've got in terms of execution plans here. I can see we went through and we did 40 statements. We, did, we have 40 execution plans. I think there's eight statements in a loop, so we must have done uh, five loops of this table. So let's take a look at some of these execution plans. So we obviously aren't using an index that's based on order date. Um, I actually don't think one exists on this table. And I know I have a example. We have a statement to create an index on the order date column in the sales order table. So let's run that now. So here's our execution plan at start, and you can see we're using the index that I just created. We're doing a constant scan. This is us basically looking at our date and calculating that expression, and then we're nested looping that to an index seek on the index that we just created that is based on date. That's allowing us to create the, to uh, to identify our hundred rows. We're populating our temp table here. So we're reading the hundred rows out of our temp table. We're joining that to the order lines table and we're returning 215 rows, which is perfectly fine. It makes sense that our order lines table would have more than one order line record for each order record, 
So we're actually getting 215 rows that are being passed up the chain, and those are all being deleted. There's no top operator on these statements, but we decided that made, uh, that made logical sense. Um, next, we go into and we identify our invoices based on the orders GC temp table. And this only returned 100 rows, so they are one-to-one. -one. That makes sense. I'm fine with that. And in the next operators, we are continuing to do nested loops join and index seeks. Uh, we don't have top operators on these because they're not necessary. The only one that we really made sense for is the query to populate the orders GC temp table to begin with. But the rest of these are fine. Some of them are deleting more than 100 rows. But again, uh, that's fine with the cardinality of these tables. And here we are deleting from the invoices table. And this plan is a bit more complicated, but that's because here we're referencing customer transactions and invoice lines and stock item transactions. We're doing that basically just to confirm that we're not violating our foreign key when we deleted those records. So that's why we deleted the records from those tables before the invoices table. And similarly, when we delete from the orders table, we're checking order lines and invoices and making sure that we're not, we haven't violated any foreign keys there. That's our comprehensive GC. Uh, this has a while loop in it, and we've discussed some of the considerations for how you, how you want to structure that and where, where you want to use a top clause and where not. In this example, we are going to be looking at an operation where we're not doing garbage collection, but we're doing anonymization. So we're going to be do doing an update statement, statement instead of a delete. So first things first, I have some scripts here. I'm going to run this, and this is going to create an index that should be useful for us. Oh, hold on a second. Okay. So this is going to create an index for us, and we're actually going to come back to this in a minute. So first, what I'm going to do is I'm going to run a query. I'm going to kind of test this out. I want to look at a thousand records from the sales invoices table that are at least 90 days old where the delivery instructions have something in them. I had to kind of look far and wide for something that actually had uh, character strings that could potentially have information that we decide we want to anonymize or obscure later on. Um, if someone has delivery instructions in an invoice, the delivery instructions are going to be probably filled in by the customer and they could say anything. Um, it could have you know names or addresses or something of that nature. Um, rather than worry about cleansing it, uh, in a, in a more complicated fashion, what we're going to do in, a, in this example is we're just going to set the delivery instructions to null for anything that's 90 days. Hopefully we've long since delivered whatever it is. But let's run a query first and see how our query operates. So we're doing a constant scan um, and we're going down into a, the index we just created. We're, we are returning a thousand rows. Okay, I'm using a thousand for my batch size. Uh, but we're only reading a thousand rows, so this is looking very promising so far. We're doing an index seek. We're not reading anything extraneous. We're not getting a hash match or something terrible. We're not sorting it. We're, we're past all of our caveats at this point. So let me see. I'm going to tell it to do a batch size of a thousand rows. And I'm going to keep track of how many rows we've updated. And I'm going to, iter I'm going to add to that each time we iterate through the loop. And in this case, I'm not going to tell it to end based on time, I'm going to tell it to go clean up 50,000 rows. And once it's got 50,000 rows, then we will exit from our loop. And the reason I'm doing this is talking about how update operations are different and how they are not self-cleaning. That comment I made earlier, we're going to test that out right now. So actually, I'm going to begin this transaction and I am not going to roll it back just yet because I want to run, uh, I want to run one more statement while we're still inside that transaction. So I am going to run this. This is going to be in a loop, deleting a thousand records at a time. Hey, that went fast enough. So now let's get the execution plan for this last statement. And as I said, update statements can get progressively slower. Let's take a look at what that looks like. We're going to tell it to delete one last batch of data that meets our same criteria. And that completed. And let's look at our execution plan. And this is exactly what I was talking about. Our index seek operator here read 51,000 rows. So our constant scan is still there. We're not doing, an, we're not doing uh, a hash match or anything. We're not doing an index scan, but we read 51,000 rows and passed 51,000 to the nested loops. And then we filtered it much later after the nested loops operator, and now we're only down to 1,000 rows. Well, why? What is, our, what is our filter there? That's where we actually filtered 
and looked at the delivery instructions. And we checked here to see if the delivery instru instructions were not null. So in, as we went through and we anonymized the first 50,000 rows, um, those records are still in the index that I created at the, begin at the beginning of this example. So we're reading those rows and having to read past them to get past the first 50,000 records to find anything that we actually need to operate on. So at this point, um, this, this operation is just going to get slower and slower every time we run this operation and the more records there are that are still on the table but have already been anonymized. So that's no good. Let's roll this transaction back. And I'm going to back up a few minutes, back up a few seconds and have things commented as they were originally. So we roll back our transaction. So this is where using filtered indexes on update statements like this are really, really valuable. So this is going to actually go through and delete the existing index and we are going to recreate it. I'm going to create it with a where clause. Our index is going to be based on the invoices table, last edited when. It's going to include the delivery instructions column but we're going to have a filter on the index and we're only going to include records where the delivery instructions are not null. So this is only going to have records that still need to be anonymized. So let's run this. And now let's go back and let's clean up our first 50,000 rows. I do not want to roll back that transaction yet, but it should only take a few seconds and that is complete. And let's see what our execution plan looks like here. Oh, there we go. We read 1,000 rows. Because we added the filter to our index, as the records are being updated and we're removing the delivery instructions, those records are now taken entirely out of the index. We don't just update that index. We're taking those records entirely out of the index. And since the optimizer is choosing to use our index that we made for this purpose, every subsequent call doesn't have to read past records that we've already dealt with. Since we took the extra step to add a filter to our index, our behavior and our performance is going to be consistent no matter how many records we've already anonymized. One last example. I mentioned previously uh, the 30% rule and how if there's an inequality search going on and SQL Server doesn't have a good estimate for how many rows will be returned back, that it will just estimate that it's going to get 30% of the table. This is a large estimate and, and it might result in changes in how our, in, in the execution plan that's being generated by the optimizer. So here's an example. We're calculating an archive date that is 70 months in the past, and we're going to do a query against the sales order table. So we've calculated our archive date, which is 70 months in the past, and we're going to run a query to see how many records we return, or how many records meet the criteria. We're just counting up the number, and we're going to return the number of rows that, that apply. Um, and we're going to compare the order date in the sales order table with, and we're going to calculate our date on the fly. So first let's run that and <laughs> first let's run that and we're going to get 40,235 rows. And if I look in my execution plan, I'm going to find that we did a constant scan. That's where we're calculating our date value. But then we do an index seek against the orders table and we return 40,326 rows. So we read one more row, but that was the point we read, we read beyond our date threshold, found the first record that didn't meet it, and so we stopped seeking at that point. We returned those rows up, and our final count was 40,325. Great. Now, if I change this, if I change our where clause to actually use the variable we calculated, archive date, you would expect that we would have the same behavior. But looking at this, there's one oddity here. We didn't, even, we didn't even read more than that, but our estimate is off. Our estimate says we should have read 47,636 rows. Well, why is that? So if I run this query and tell it to give me the count of rows on the table and the count of 30% of that, you'll see what I mean. When we used the variable, which doesn't have statistics, SQL Server couldn't really estimate how many rows that were going, were going to be uh, returned by this query, so it, it guessed the 30%. And it guessed that we were going to return 47,000 rows instead of 40,000 rows. So it's good to know in these circumstances that, for example, you want to calculate your dates on the fly rather than storing them in a variable. SQL Server's estimates are going to be better. That might mean the difference between it using uh, one execution plan, one kind of join another, or using one index versus using another index. So 
This is probably, a, this might be a bit of a niche example, but a lot of your queries, if you're doing, say, garbage collection, retention period, archival type queries, it, they're going to be frequently based on dates and they're going to be inequalities. So you might see strange behavior in this area. And so this is a good thing to be aware of. So those are all the examples that I had for, uh, for this presentation. Hopefully you have found those uh, illuminating. Uh, thank you very much for coming to my session. This is my first SQL uh, Pass Summit session, so I'm very happy to be here. Uh, if you have any questions, please feel free to follow up with me uh, by email or by Twitter. I hope you enjoy your session, and I guess uh, I hope you will enjoy the QA and have some good questions for me. Thank you very much.